we're going to sit back and take some questions. Okay. What do you think, what do you think of the, the point of the verse that day, days do not let the sun go down when you're angry? Should you resolve problems ASAP or wait until the morning? Okay, so that, that, that's a great verse where, where it actually says that do not let the sun go down in your anger for you'll give the devil a foothold. And, and I, think that, I think there's some, some truth to that sense that, that the devil can get a foothold when we hold on to anger. And as a general principle, it is a good idea to stay connected before the sun goes down. It doesn't mean you're going to resolve everything. There, there we go. Okay. I agree with that. Yeah, so there are times where, where we'll have something we're still sort of wrestling with. 20 years. 20 years later. That's a lot of sundowns. Right? But sometimes, particularly if, guys, if you're flooding, if you're getting overwhelmed, sometimes you need a good night's rest. Or if, if it was a bad day at work or you, you don't, haven't had enough sleep, you just need some sleep. It's kind of like those Snickers bar. You're kind of grouchy when you don't have a Snickers. <laughs> Okay, uh, so sometimes just a good night of sleep, but here's the deal. You both have to agree that you're waiting. Right? One of the things that we do, we kiss each other good night every night, even when we're in the middle of a fight. And if he, we're going to... He asks permission yeah, first, though. I, I do. <laughs> you, you, you know, it's kind of the testing the water, seeing how she responds. And if she turns away, then I'm like, oh, Okay. <laughs> So I, I, I would not make it a hard and fast rule because then you can actually just make things worse trying to kind of solve everything before you can go to sleep. Yeah, so the, I think the verse really says check your heart, right? Because anger is, is, is it still building up inside of you? Or are you able to, you know, ask for forgiveness from God first? And maybe you're still working on how to talk about it with your partner. Um, so deal with your anger, but that doesn't mean the problem has to be solved before the sun goes down. Those are two different things. Yep. Okay. Next one. Um, what if the other, what if the other per partner or person refuses to work things out? We joked ahead of time. She actually said, we're going to get this question. And I half jokingly said, okay, I'm dishing this off to you. So I'm dishing this off to you. Okay. Every couple that comes into therapy thinks it's the other person who won't change. I've done all the changing, but the other person won't. So I knew this would come up, and it, and, but it's also true. And sometimes you feel like your partner doesn't really invest in the relationship at the level that you do. So um, with the four love killers, if one of you is working really hard to not have the love killers show up, that in itself is already gonna help the relationship be healthier than if both of you were you know, being critical or stonewalling. Um, and then the other thing, a beautiful thing about one of us changing is that it automatically changes the dynamic between us. So in the past, and sometimes in the right now too. Yeah, in the present. <laughs> and I had confessed that I used to be really critical of Greg, right? So instead of attacking the problem, I would attack his character. He did a good job of not attacking back. Because mm -hmm. if he had, we probably wouldn't be here today. Right, so just one of you growing and changing will already, in a sense, change the relationship. So don't give up. Yeah. Um, it may take years. I mean, Greg waited at least seven <laughs> years for me to change. So, and for me to grow up a little bit. Yeah, both of us <laughs> did. So don't give up being the one who is humble and willing to change, because that will have an influence on the other person as well. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, what do you do when your spouse isn't as spiritual as you need them to be? Okay, so what do you do when your spouse isn't as spiritual as you need them to be? Well, so a couple things. I think one is, is to realize you don't need them to be spiritual. Okay, it's not your response. In fact, if you need them to be spiritual, something's actually wrong inside you. Because you're, in a sense, using them to feed something in you. Okay, so there's, there's something about this sense like, like you want something so bad. Like, have you ever wanted something so badly for someone else? That kind of says as much about you as it does for the other person. 
Okay? Now, so, so that's kind of number one. But that said, if, what if this question were, were more like, um, what, what, what do you do when your spouse isn't as spiritually geared as, as you desire them to be, or you wish they were, or you, you hoped for them to be? Okay? So if it's a need, it's actually more about you. But if it's a desire, then that's out of, that's out of love. It's out of, of, of um, kind of compassion for them. It's not out of compulsion. I need you to be this way. Okay? Um, so that's kind of the, the first half of the answer. Now, the second half of the answer, I'll leave to the person who dealt for many years and in some ways still does deal with someone who is not as spiritual as she wishes that he was. That would be me. <laughs> um, I think the need, as Greg said, it, it's about us, right? Why do I need him to be more X? And you know what it was? I actually didn't need him to be more spiritual. I needed him to be more like me. Like he needed to pray the way I did. He needed to uh, seek God the way I did. He needed to be emotional when he hears songs like I am. And so, <laughs> Selah. <laughs> so it wasn't exactly that I needed him to be more spiritual. I needed him to do spirituality the way God created me. And, and that, that just will never happen, ladies. <laughs> um, and so it was me growing to learn how God created Greg and how God connects with Greg and how Greg's personality connects with God. And, and in that way, then I can encourage him and I can actually appreciate when he does connect with God, even though it looks really different from the way I connect with God. Um, and it, in me, I was getting confused with desiring him to be, to do things my way and confusing it with my desire for him to be close to God. And so I wanted him to be close to God, but I wanted it my way. And that's where I went wrong. So next one. How do you work on saying sorry after an argument, especially when you're too prideful or the other is too prideful? So how do you say sorry when you kind of have too much pride? That's going to be me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think a part of the way you do it is, I'm sorry. Now, <laughs> I know that's rather simplistic, but the real answer, actually my first answer to this, was you need help from God. Okay? One of the amazing gifts of the Holy Spirit, which is in every believer, is power. To do stuff we can't do. So when you're exactly in the spot of, I, I cannot say I'm sorry. I'm going to lose face, uh, everything I've grown up, and okay, and guys, let's face it, we're a little bit more of this, where we got kind of that ego, and um, where it, this is where you say, okay, God, help me. Help me to let go of my pride. If there's anything that God is in the business of, it's fighting against pride in us. It was the very first thing God dealt with, and it's still the thing God deals with. So that's when you ask, oh, God, help me get rid of my pride. Help me say I'm sorry. And you go up and you do, and you, you pray for that help to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to do something you can't. Because none of us can really apologize well. That's, what, that's God in us who does that. And for me, um, part of learning how to say I'm sorry is to be specific about what I'm sorry about. So even if we had a disagreement and, and I don't agree with him, I can apologize for not taking time to understand his point of view. So you can always find some, your part and, and apologize for, for that. But I agree with Greg. Just the words are powerful. I'm sorry. So practice it when, when you're driving your car. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Because the more you say it, the easier <laughs> it will be for your tongue to actually say those things. Yeah, so here's another one. Um, how do you stay positive even though you live with negative people? Um, I think part of it is to understand that your negativity, or sorry, your positivity should not necessarily be based on someone else's negativity. Because if you, if you let someone else's positive and negative be the one that drives you positive and negative, trust me, that is a terrible place to be. <laughs> In fact, uh, the book of James uses this word picture of a boat out on this really stormy sea just getting tossed everywhere 
That's kind of what it's like if your state of mind or your kind of heart is dependent on what the other person's heart and state of mind is. Because then you're just all over the place. And, um, and I dealt with that because she was kind of all over the place earlier in our marriage. Now I'm a little bit more the one who's all over the place sometimes. And um, So that's what I would say is the, the, the biggest way to do that, the biggest way to keep your positivity is to understand that the reason we are positive is not because the other person's positive but because we are a child of God, we are forgiven by God, we are loved by God, we are cherished by God. Everything good in us comes from God because if we're trying to get that from the other person, you're sort of in for a world of hurt. Yeah, and for, for those of you who are normally or in your personality, you're pretty positive, it's a gift to the people around you. So it's one way that you can love your spouse if, you, if they're negative and you're a positive person, that you can pour positivity into mm-hmm. their life. So like this morning, I was singing all morning. And yesterday you were singing all I was about to comment this morning how you've been singing a whole lot. It's like, that's kind of cool. They're like old timey hymns. <laughs> like, yeah, she's an old person in like a young person's body. Yes. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Still a young Thank person. You. Yeah. I was going to go middle-aged person. I'm like, dude, I'm sleeping on the sofa if I say that. <laughs> no, no, you would have said, I'm sorry. And then like, That's right. <laughs> yeah, so, so bless people with your positivity. Um, it is a blessing. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, while you were rain, waiting, referring to me, while you were waiting for Pofor to change for seven years, how, how were you able to wait, and what did you do to be able to wait for that change? Okay. Well, here's the thing. While, while I was kind of waiting for her to change, I was young and immature and defensive and stonewalling. Uh, I was a terrible communicator. I was emotionally shut off. Uh, so what I did was I learned and I grew because it wasn't just me kind of twiddling my thumbs being like, I got it good here, man. Get in the game. Like seven, no, it's like, okay, I'm kind of a putz here as well. I'm young and immature. I'm terrible at communicating my emotions. I would stonewall a lot. Uh, I would get very defensive. So I learned some amazing skills that I taught you guys here over the last few weeks about affirmations, about I statements, reflective listening, all of these things that kind of beat the killers. I learned those in my first few years of marriage because I didn't really know how to be... um, a great emotionally relational husband. I could be a worker husband and like a go out to the beach husband, but not like a relational emotional connector husband. So the short answer to that is I worked on myself. Yeah. And we talked earlier about what if your spouse isn't changing and you are. Um, I think that what saved our marriage too is that Greg was very good at saying I'm sorry, even if he didn't know what he had done. Like he'd be like, obviously I hurt you. I don't know what I did, but I'm really sorry. Um, and he was very quick to forgive me on the rare occasion that I would apologize. Um, so those things actually kept, kept us engaged because he didn't totally disconnect. And mm-hmm. he was more gracious to me. Um, and there were times where you kind of were kind of clueless. So you did bring positivity into the marriage because you didn't even know it was that bad. I feel like I'm really far away from you. you oh, yeah, because they, they already have the text. There we go. That's better. Okay. All right. So what's the movie today? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's a little too close. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. Um, how do you deal with a spouse who's too opinionated that makes you feel at times or that you're not being heard? Okay. That makes you feel bad or you're not being heard. Um, what do you do? What do you, how do you deal with a spouse who's too opinionated who makes you either feel bad or feel like you're not being heard. Um, That's where those I feel statements come in. That was an incredibly valuable thing that I learned because I had no idea how to communicate when I was angry or when I was hurt. Um, So so you might you might try things like um, I I feel disempowered when you make statements about my ability to fix the car. Okay. Rather than saying stop that you, or, or start bashing them, kind of the criticism, use those I feel statements. Um, I feel rejected 
when, when, you, when you make critical jokes about my cooking. Um, I feel, so it's those I feel statements. Because people can argue with opinions. It's really hard to argue with a feeling. What are they going to say? No, you don't feel that way? No, I'm fairly sure I do. <laughs> but, but the reason arguments escalate is we, we throw those barbs, those, those contemptuous words at the other person. You're so opinionated. No, I'm not. Well, okay, that's going nowhere. Rather than saying, um, I, felt, I felt embarrassed when we were at dinner with my friends and you made a joke about my job. Where you can express these emotions. Now, the challenge is you have to understand your emotions. And that's where I was oblivious. Zero, like zero clue. I'm clueless about a lot of things. I was really clueless about that one. Okay? So my single best piece of advice, guys, um, for understanding your emotions. Girls, you're kind of wired to understand your emotions. You do it much better than we ever could. Okay? But here's my, okay, Google um, emotion words list. And you will actually find some amazing lists. In fact, I'm going to post one. I found a great one. I'm going to post it up on our website and put it up on Facebook. Uh, it's one that we give to pretty much all the people that we do premarital with. Well, it occurs to me that most of you already know how to pick your emoticon. Is that what? There you go. Speak in emojis. Yeah. Okay. And don't use the poop emoji. That's not it. Okay. <laughs> Unless you feel like poop. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> That, that's, that's actually a great... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a new chart. I'm going to create an emoji I feel chart. No, that, that's old school, man. Oh, okay. okay. Right. So, yeah, so think, think in emojis. What, you, probably, you, you probably at times spend more energy thinking about how you're feeling for your Facebook post than how you're feeling toward your spouse. Okay? I'm feeling blessed, feeling pissed off, feeling... Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so just Facebook post your wife face-to-face, -face, though. So as, as the person in our marriage who is very opinionated, I can tell you that what, what kind of dampened my being so opinionated was Greg affirming me. So we, we've taught you how to do affirmations, right? Part of having so many opinions is you want people to tell you how smart you are and how right you are. So the more Greg did that, then the less I needed to tell him my opinion. Mm -hmm. So that really helped. I know it sounds weird, but like if somebody's really opinion, you just say, you're really smart. That'll shut them up. Because they'll be like... And don't go, you're really smart. <laughs> no, that's... <laughs> but it, it did, because then it, I felt like he understood my reason for being so opinionated. And then I didn't need to show off as much. Okay. Um, how do you forgive when you're still upset after a fight? And okay. one of the hardest things about forgiveness, forgiveness feels like you're losing power. Part of what holding on to being upset is, you're holding on to what you think is power. If you're angry with the other person, that it feels like power over them. And to forgive feels like you're letting go of power. It feels like you're losing. In fact, there's a great song, and that's sort of the chorus of it. Forgiveness feels like losing. But it's actually not. The amazing thing about forgiveness is it actually, it frees you. And so staying upset, part of staying upset is you're trying to hold on to the power of being hurt or the power over your spouse because you're in the right and they're in the wrong. And a fundamental element of the Christian life is letting go of our power. The Bible has words like, like pick up your cross, um, self-sacrifice, self-denial, deny yourself. So th that's kind of what this is where, where we have to say, okay, I admit I'm the one holding on to the anger here because I want the power. I want to st stay convinced I'm right. That's usually what upset means. <laughs> I want to stay convinced I'm right here. And, and it's actually a choice. It's an active choice to lay that down, to say, okay, God, I am letting that down. I'm putting my sword down in a sense and turning to forgive. There aren't many times when I prefer the Hmong word to the English word for a concept. This is the one time where Hmong, the Hmong word captures forgiveness 
I think better than the English word. In Hmong, we say zhang zi, right? It literally translates to, I forgive your sin. Zi is sin, and zhang is to overlook it, to, to let it go. Uh, it's a legal term. I, don't, <laughs> I no longer hold you guilty for what you did. And so, in a sense, that's what you're doing when you forgive. And um, it's hard for me to forgive. Uh, that was, that was a, one of the things that really hurt our marriage, mm -hmm. too, is that I would hold on to a grudge. I could hold on to a grudge for six months, and, and Greg would be, like, clueless until maybe the fifth month. <laughs> yeah. And it was because... I did not want to let him off the hook. And so I, I refused to let go of, you know, I have the right to punish you. And so forgiveness is letting go of your right to punish the other person. And, and for me, it was a convicting from the Holy Spirit that um, how much have I been forgiven? Like if God didn't forgive me the way that I'm not forgiving Greg, then where would I be? So that was very convicting. Am I going to hold his sin against him? So, so it's 1120 right now. We're, we're going to take a couple more questions and then wrap up. And the question that we didn't get to, we're going to answer up on, on our website and Facebook. Next couple days, we'll knock these guys out. Okay. What or how can you move on from the past when one partner always continues bringing it up? When they weren't even part of the past? Uh, and so we, we'll kind of talk a little bit. So in our relationship, I was certainly the one with the past. She had kind of the squeaky clean. I had the not so squeaky clean. <laughs> um, and particularly, there were a lot of girls I dated. I, I was kind of a player before player ended with an A. <laughs> <It was laughs> um, and so, and, and so, so when we talked about it and she found out, that was really hard for her. But originally, the, the discussion was, it's no big deal. This was even before I knew you. This was way before. This was high school. Just kind of let it go. It, you weren't a part of it. I wasn't against you. It was, it was, just, it was again, it was in my past. Okay? Notice all of that is defensiveness. There was not a single non-defensive statement there. Okay? For us, the conversation changed when I began to understand how much that impacted her. So instead of being defensive, remember Gottman's defensiveness, the solution to defensiveness is taking responsibility. It's looking at the plank in your own eye, not the speck, the little speck of sriracha on, on your spouse's shirt. Okay? Um, so I had to start to own up that, yes, it was before her. Yes, she had nothing to do with it. But that doesn't matter. It's still hurt. It still affected her. And the more I did to understand how it affected her, the less of a big deal it was. Because really, she was just wanting to know. I just wanted him to say sorry. Yeah. <laughs> just, to, just to say, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was before your time, but I understand how this, how this hurt you. I'm so sorry. But because we make these defensive excuses. It was before your time. The, I, I was an idiot back then. Whatever, whatever your defense, defensiveness never solves the problem. And this holds true if it's about something that happened in the relationship and the person, your partner keeps bringing it up. Do you just apologize right then and say, I, I see how much what happened hurt you. I'm really sorry. Okay, so, so we'll do one more, and then we'll hit the, the rest online. Okay? Uh, how, can we be, how can we be more spiritual together? I want to grow spiritually, but my partner doesn't seem interested. Okay? Those are actually two completely different questions. Okay? Because the second one, I want to grow spiritually, but my partner doesn't seem interested? Grow spiritually. What's the problem? <laughs> so those are two things. And again, if you're making yourself dependent upon the other person, that's a no-win ball game. No one wins that fight. So part of what changed in my relationship mm -hmm. with, with Greg is that I, I stopped blaming my lack of a spiritual life on him. 
um, and taking ownership for my spiritual growth. And as I began to grow spiritually again, then I had much more grace for him, and the Holy Spirit had much more <laughs> access to me, and the Holy Spirit could convict me to say, you know, you're not forgiving him, you're not being gentle, you're not... And, and so if you are healthy spiritually, you won't need to control your partner to be more spiritual because the Holy Spirit will stop you. Um, and I've always said to Greg, you need to worry the moment that I'm not connected to God because all those horsemen, those love killers are going to show up again if, if I'm not connected to the Holy Spirit. So the stronger and the more... Uh, connected to God, the more I'm growing spiritually, the healthier our relationship. So don't wait for the other person. And you know the amazing thing? When she stopped kind of controlling and being bossy and guilt-laden. Um, critical contempt. And critical and contemptuous, I started to grow. I started to own my own faith. Because it wasn't about her wanting faith for me. Because there was a part of me that was like, well, Screw you. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to give you the satisfaction of winning. But when, when it was kind of up to me, I did it at my own pace and kind of in my own way. Because like she was saying, our spiritualities are very different. And that took a lot of years for us. And we're still wrestling with what that looks like. Yeah, so basically what was happening was I wasn't connected to the Holy Spirit, but I was trying to play the Holy Spirit's role in Greg's life. We tend to make lousy Holy Spirits. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unholy people make lousy Holy Spirits. So, yeah, so that was the amazing thing that happened with me is I started to grow and I, I started to, to own my own faith because it was, a, it was for me, not for her. Yeah, so I know our time is almost up, but I want to say this to all of you so you can save yourself hundreds and thousands of dollars in family therapy, couples therapy. What you need to do to get rid of the love killers is to get on your spouse's side, like to fight for them, to be on their side. Because uh, if you fight for their spirituality because you love them and you want them to know God, that will look very different than if you're critical because they don't do it the way that you wish they did. Um, and so being on someone's side, and, and Greg is a great cheerleader. Mm -hmm. Go team. I was actually a cheerleader in college. <laughs> but he was, he was always for me. Put around my hand. Thank you, honey. I need that. He was always for me, even when I was in the wrong. And again, that helped really save our marriage. Um, so anything you can do to come alongside your partner to say, you know what, I'm on your side. You know, those things that you said hurt me, but I'm on your side. So I must have done something that really hurt you. So tell me, you know. Um, and when I do couples therapy, I can tell the moment that the therapy changes is when the couple gets on the same page. And they're like, you know what? Mm -hmm. I did hurt you, but I don't want to. And then they, they start uh, fighting the love killers together. Okay. Um, so do we have a quick moment to have people practice affirmations? Yeah, let's go for it. We're, okay. We're, yeah, we got a few minutes. All right. Keep so, going, kids ministry. <laughs> so if your partner is here with you, I'd like you to turn to them. And we have those little cards. Louie, can you grab them from the back there? If you don't have the cards, those little cards. Yeah, check the info table. I think they might be out there. One side says, you know, affirmations. If you could just turn to your partner, hold their hand and say... I affirm you for, uh, and just say one thing, uh, preferably a characteristic. You know, I affirm you for being patient, period. Don't go into a lot of explanation of what that looked like, okay? Um, so we're, and then take turns. And if you don't have your partner here with you, grab a brother or sister from the church and just say, hey, here's what I see in you, yeah. okay? So we'll give you a little example. So, hon, I want to affirm you for your joyous spirit. Kiss optional, but totally worth it. <laughs> well, hopefully you are feeling very affirmed. And so, so now we're going to leave you feeling blessed. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Go in God's grace and have a great day.